George Soros and some other speculators decided to attack the British pound. So explain, how did it work? How did they make a profit? What happened? Uh, to the re, uh, the release of the UK 
make sense. Yes. So what did they do to counteract? Uh, they, they, they increased the interest rate. Mm -hmm. And? And they sold the uh, foreign exchange, yes. uh, resources, and gold. Mm -hmm. But those kind of resources are not, uh, they, uh, they are limited. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, in the end, they couldn't count. They couldn't counteract to the uh, release of the currency. Yes. So they had to just they, they had to uh, just see devalue the currency, right? Yes. Leave the peg. So what did Britain lose because they left the peg? Britain gained. We said that their economy improved a lot over the next couple of years. Of course, that time also coincided with some. Uh, the mid 90s was a growth period around the world because of the internet boom, right? But their economy picked up a lot then in the mid 90s. So, what did Britain lose? Looks like they only won. Industry, in the car industry, and other heavy industry. Mm -hmm. Well, any industry which is dependent on imports is going to have a problem if your currency gets weaker, right? Your, if your industry, is, your company is very reliant on imports to make your product, then you'll have a problem. Okay. Any other problem for the British government? Do you understand credibility? Did the British government lose credibility? Yes. Yeah, so politically, politically, the British government lost some credibility. Okay. <coughs> but also. In this case, the banks can have some problem because the banks may have borrowed a lot of dollars and now they and lent to people in Britain with British pounds. Now they have to change the they're getting less pound they're getting pounds back from the British people, but it can't pay back all the dollars they got the loan off from the foreign bank, right? So banks can also have a problem in that case. So here's the Mexican peso, the same thing. Right, this time, on this case, we have to remember pound is on the left, dollar is on the right. But in other currencies almost always, dollar is on the left and the other currency is on the right. So in this case, the graph is the opposite, right? So we have uh, here, one dollar is 3.1 pesos. It was pegged from 1993, 94, and so on. Then suddenly, around this time here, uh, the peso left peg and devalued to from 3.1 to 3.5 from January to July okay. in Mexico. What about Filipinos during the Asian crisis? Filipino peso, just like the Thai bat, was pegged to the US dollar. At 26 pesos was one dollar. Okay. What happened? This is the Asian crisis 1997. It went from 27 to 42. Is that a big change? Yes. And then since that time, we kept going weaker to 50. Okay. What about the uh, implications for regional economic growth? The average GDP growth in all of these Asian countries between 1987 and 1996 was quite good. A lot of these companies was opening up their economy. Countries were opening their economy and growing quickly. Okay, so they were growing seven percent a year. Malaysia ten percent a year. Thailand ten percent a year. So a lot of money was flowing into those countries. If Thailand is growing at ten percent a year, do you want to invest in Thailand? Yes, a lot of people invested in real estate and in other areas in Thailand and Malaysia, right? Foreign banks and foreign investors. But then we had the crisis. So in 1997 to 1999, we can see the effect. These countries which were paid to the US dollar, like Thailand and the Philippines, they uh, suddenly came off the peg to the US dollar. Okay? There was a crisis. In the crisis period, things can get a lot worse in the short term. So they had a lot of short term problems okay? in their economy. GDP growth was very low. Did Korea have a lot of problems in 1997, short-term problems? Yes. But in the long term, do you think it was better for Korea or worse? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe 
the earth program, if we go to say, right? Anyway, the point of this graph is that the crisis caused a lot of problems in the short term. Right? So for, for companies and investors, they could lose a lot of money in Thailand if they invested in Thailand or the Philippines or somewhere like that, right? Because they left the peg. So <coughs> the, look at the stock markets across Asia. So I invested in stocks in Korea. Korean stock market went down 42% because of the crisis in the Korean won. But when we change our Korean won back to US dollars, it actually went down 70%. So if I invested in stocks in Korea, how much money did I lose? How much of my money did I lose? 70% of my money. Am I happy? <laughs> I was saving for my children to go to college, to university. <laughs> I decided to invest in stocks in Korea. Why? It's a very fast growing economy, right? It's been growing 7% a year. It's great. Then there's a currency crisis and I lose 70% of my money. Right? So the point is that currency crisis can cause big risk or big loss for investors. You can see other losses here. Malaysia, 68%. Japan, 30%. Thailand, 76%. <coughs> so that's why you need to be alert about changes in the exchange rate regime. Okay? That kind of thing happening. Argentina 2002 was pegged one peso to one dollar. That was very simple until they changed and then it went floating down to four, 3.75 or four. So that's the most serious one we've seen, right? Changes from one to four in just three months. Okay, so it was changing a lot every day. So Usually we said the currency is going to depreciate against the dollar after we leave the peg. This is percent. So which currency is this one? Depreciate 350% against the dollar. Which country was that? So in this case we have Russia, right? Argentina, 200%. Here we have uh, Mexico, okay? And Thailand. So, 50%, 100%, 200%, 300% depreciation against the US dollar after they left the pegged regime. So let's have a look at the case study of Rus Russian ruble. We have in 1998, the Russian crisis of 1998. So this is in the reading files. We have two pages. So in 1991, we had the breakup of the Soviet Union, and we had new financial difficulties in Russia. So through the 90s, the Russian government spending exceeded their tax revenues, resulting in a federal deficit. Federal deficit is government spending is higher than tax. How did they finance the deficit? Borrowing and printing currency, the ruble. Okay. If you're printing your own currency, what can happen? Inflation, right? It can be a problem. But anyway, they were able to keep the, stable, the Russian ruble stable against the dollar. So the, during this time, the ruble was under a managed float. Okay? They would just let the currency change like the Chinese one, slowly against the dollar. For example, between 1996-97, it could change at 1.5% a month. So every day the central bank would announce an exchange rate. If the rate was above or below the announced band, the central bank would intervene, buying or selling the currency. We already explained about this, okay, to keep the exchange rate stable. So just similar to Asia, in this time period, Russian borrowers borrowed large amounts in US dollars. Okay? So they borrowed $160 billion in US dollars. Why did Russia need the dollars? Why were they borrowing a lot of dollars? Spending was exceeding the tax revenue. Okay? They were spending more money than they were getting in taxes. So they were getting loans. 
in US dollars. Uh, 160 billion US dollars. Okay, so they need US dollars to pay back the interest and pay back the money. Unfortunately, the US dollars that Russia was earning on its trade, it was trading and it had a current account surplus. What does that mean, current account surplus? Selling more exports than you were buying, right? They were leaving the country in the form of capital flight and were not available to service the debt. So the, the dollars in China, the system they have, the companies have to deposit their dollars in the bank and the bank has to give the dollars to the central bank. So the Chinese central bank ends up with the dollars, right? But in Russia, in this case, they weren't giving the money to the bank or the Russian central bank. So the Russian central bank wasn't getting the dollars. What were the companies doing with the dollars? Instead of depositing the money in Russian banks. Or Russian people doing with the dollars. They were buying properties in London, right? Or they were buying other things, investing in, in Switzerland. They weren't keeping the dollars in Russia. Okay? They were sending them to another country. So Russia, despite the fact that it had a capital account surplus, or sorry, current account surplus, was not able to pay back the dollars. Okay? Also, we had a fall in commodity prices. Russian economy is also dependent on exports of oil, timber, and gold. So because this price fell, they were getting less money, less dollars. So sensing that Russia was running out of hard currency, speculated with attacks against the currency insured. Do you ever watch the National Geographic channel? Do you watch the lions hunting? Lions hunting on the TV? When the lions are hunting, do they choose the healthy buffalo or the one that's injured? Injured. Why? Easy to hunt or easy to catch, right? So you can imagine the spec some speculators are going around looking for some country which is injured or wounded, right? Then they can attack that country and make a profit. Do you think they're nice people? No. <laughs> Why not? Hmm? That's the way it is. That's life, you think? <laughs> That's like Africa? You're like a lion? The world is like it. Yes. That's, that the world is. Lions eat buffaloes? <laughs> the way of the world? Yes, it's life. So, why do you think they're bad people? Because they are protesting. 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 Wounded, wounded countries, people lost their money and home and okay. their family. So imagine I'm the speculator, right? <laughs> I'm arguing with you. So I tell you, anyway they're going to lose their home and family. It's just a question of time, right? If I don't attack now, the economy is going to get worse and worse, and then they will lose their home and family gradually over five years. <laughs> but it's better that I attack now, and they have a big problem, and then they can recover. It's like pulling out the thorn out of your arm. It's sore now, but it's better for the long term. Now what do you say? Me. I'm a speculator, back in Korea in 1997. I'm helping you in the long term. I'm helping your government's doing a bad job, and I'm finishing them quickly. You have to change your plan and change your strategy. Your country has to change. But they... I'm helping you. But our country don't cure the self hmm? Our country economy is Mm -hmm. our union. People will get together and cure the country yourself? Yes. Okay then. <laughs> I don't agree, right? I think you need me to help you. <laughs> like, uh, I'm just helping you really. If I make some profit at the same time, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> Maybe I'll give it to charity. Really, I just wanted to help you. Are you grateful? <laughs> so, actually, the speculator's main 
idea is to get the profit, but they always have some explanation or justification for their argument, right? So the Russian government responded to support the ruble by raising the interest rates. Okay, so we can see the same story as England, right? The speculators are attacking selling the Russian ruble because it's in a managed currency. Okay, so uh, by May 27, 1998, the interest rate was 150%. Okay, in February they were 42%. Okay, how old were you then? Eight. Can you remember? No. no. So, even though this, I give you this high interest rate, people still didn't want to have the ruble. They were selling the ruble. <coughs> but even at this high interest rate, they get a loan and sell the ruble. So in August, there was intense pressure. So in August, the central bank announced that its currency reserves had fallen by 800 million in one week. So Russia spent 800 million of their reserves of gold and so on in one week. So the stock market fell because of fears that China would devalue their won, which they did this year in August, right? Which would hurt Russian exports. So Boris Yeltsin said on August the 14th, there will be no devaluation of the ruble. That's for sure. Right? What do you think happened the next day or the next week? Right? So usually it's like a football manager. When you see the chairperson come out and they say, we're not going to fire the football manager, never. <laughs> then you know that probably the football manager is going to get fired, right? Next day or next week. It's a sign. So the next uh, three days later, the central bank said they would devalue the ruble. Okay? The markets thought this was a panic move and they continued to sell the ruble. The ruble went down to, it was here, around 6 to 1 US dollar, then it went down to 11. Okay. So the Russian central bank spent $8.8 .8 billion defending the ruble. The ruble went to 13. Okay. They closed the currency exchange and there was a real crisis. So we can see this was the case in Russia. Okay. Even the higher depreciation than Argentina. Right? So can you understand this situation in Russia, similar to the UK? Yes. Run out of the foreign reserves and they can't put up the interest rate anymore. So nothing to do, right? Even if they want, it doesn't matter how much they want to stay in the pegged regime. It's just not possible, okay? Unless somebody helps them, if somebody else starts buying their currency, but. You know, are you going to start buying the Russian ruble when it's under a speculative attack by people selling it? We can see the Russian central bank lost 8.8 .8 billion dollars, right? Also, the British central bank lost a lot of money. So basically, the amount that the Russian central bank lost is the amount that the speculators won in the end. Did they make a good profit? <laughs> Do you want to be a speculator? Do you want to be a speculator? <laughs> Are you sure? You make a lot of money. <laughs> <coughs> so, it's like currently the Chinese stock market was going down a lot this year, right? So, what do you think? There was a lot of Chinese people who bought stocks. Their first time to buy stock and open an account. They have their life savings and they can lose their money. They have some picture on the TV of the young family crying because they invested in the stock and they lost their money, right? What are you going to do? You know the stock price is going down. Are you going to short the Chinese stock market or not? You can make a profit shorting the Chinese stock market. Shorting means that you're selling the stocks. The stock price is going down. Getting a loan of the stocks and then selling them. What are you going to do? That's, you said that's life, right? If I don't sell it, I lose my money. No, no, just, you're just a speculator. You're living in Korea. And you can see this Chinese stock market is line is going down, right? Very quickly. And you think it's going to go down more because it's a crisis. What are you going to do? Are you going to jump on the bandwagon and start shorting the Chinese stocks? Or not? You can buy some fund on the down. 
do you know down finance? Yes. <coughs> so we can see that if you bought this fund at the start of the year, it could be. You know ETFs, exchange traded fund. Did you ever look at down finance? Where is the ETF? Okay. <laughs> so you can buy some ETF. And uh, we can find here is China, right? It's still going up. <coughs> so this says Tiger China inverse. Do you understand the inverse? Yes. So it's shorting the China. You're betting the China. You're basically you're getting a loan of Chinese stocks and selling them. How much is it up today? One Are you going to buy this now? Hmm? What's the trend? Hmm? It started the year at 10,000, it's now 16,000. So you would have made a profit of 60, about 50 or 60%, right, from the start of the year, shorting the Chinese stock market. You can see here's a big jump, right? So people can do that. Do you understand shorting? Yes. What does shorting mean? Selling. Selling and hoping the price goes down, okay? Then you can buy back at the cheaper price. So we get a loan and we sell and we hope the price goes down. So that's how that works. So you can just buy this fund very easily. Okay? You go to the stockbroker and buy the fund. So I'm asking you, what are you going to do? You can see that you, maybe you're going to make a big profit here by shorting the Chinese stock market. And then you see the news report on the TV, the family is crying because their <laughs> stock, stock price is going down and they invest a lot of money in stocks. What are you going to do? can make 60%. You're very slow to answer. I think you're cha are you changing your mind? <laughs> what are you going to do? Would you have bought this fund in January? Make a 60% profit? Does it affect the family negatively? Of course, their stock price. you're selling the stock, which is causing the stock price to go down. It's like the Speculators selling the currency, causing the currency price to go down. Everybody is selling, then the price is going down, right? Let's say we're in January and you're pretty sure it's going to go, you get 60% profit if you short the Chinese stocks. Are you going to do it? You have a time machine, you go back to January, you know this is going to happen. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to do it? What about you? No, you're not going to do Okay. So it depends on the person, right? What you think is fair or what is not fair. People can say, if I don't sell the stock, somebody else is going to sell the stock, right? It's going to go down anyway, right? So I might as well make some money on following the other speculators. So you can understand these market attacks. George Soros makes a very public attack. So people say, I'm going to jump on the back of George Soros and make some money for myself even if it's not big money, right? I can make some money. So then there's more and more people join in together. And that's why they say under attack, like under attack from a lot of people. So Chinese government is trying to defend against the stock market, but harder to, to defend against the stock market. They're not doing very well. They made a lot of regulations, but didn't work that well. Okay. So you're going to go home now and <laughs> check this fund, China inverse on down. You can invest 100,000 won, it's okay, right? Just for interest sake. If I can go back to the past. Hmm? If, I can, if I can go back to the past. Maybe in the future, who knows? I guess my problem. You have to ask the stock advisor, right? Don't listen to me because then you can come back <laughs> <laughs> later. Right? So don't tell your father to sell his house and <laughs> invest in the China inverse. Suddenly the Chinese stock market goes up. So, so changes in the exchange rate regime can make the risk for the global firm. 
So, using the Argentine example, discuss the following. What do you think happened to foreign multinationals located in and selling in Argentina after the peso weakened? For example, McDonald's US dollars profits in Argentina. So, discuss with your partner. What will happen to US do McDonald's dollar profits? Price the same, you can see my dollar profit is going to be much lower. Okay? If I increase the price, maybe I'll sell a lot less hamburgers. Okay? Competing against the local, McDonald's probably imports its special sauces and meat for the hamburger and other things, right? So if I'm competing against the local guy who's using the local meat and the local product, then I won't sell as much. So actually, when I was in South America, usually going to McDonald's is like uh, going to a little bit expensive restaurant, mm -hmm. right? It's like a kind of luxury thing because the price is so high compared to the local restaurant. Because in the local restaurant, you can get some meat and rice and beans for two dollars, but if you go to McDonald's, it costs five dollars for a Big Mac. Okay? So people don't really go to McDonald's that much. It's kind of just uh, more aimed at the upper market. Next question, discuss with your partner. What do you think happened to foreign multinationals exporting to Argentina after the peso weakened? For example, do you know Boeing? Yes, plane. Boeing is a plane company. Their ability to export airplanes to Argentina.
What's that? Why? Okay, they can't pay for the plane anymore. It's too expensive for them, right? Now with the exchange rate and the money they have, the Boeing plane got more expensive. So let's say that it was five million, one plane was five million dollars, right? Before they needed 5 million pesos to pay for the plane, right? How many plane, how many pesos do they need to pay for a 5 million dollar plane now? 100. Hmm? 20 million. Now they need 20 million pesos, okay? Pay for a plane. So the price of the plane went up, right? The foreign export. So that's when you make your currency weaker, okay? Then the last one, what do you think happened to the portfolios of investors holding Argentinian stocks and bonds? Discuss with your partner. The investor is foreign investor. Yes, US investor. They, have, they want to send their kids to college and they think Argentina looks like a great country to invest in. South America, very exciting. Right? Nice music. I'll invest there. So I invest a lot of my money for my kids' education in stocks in Argentina and bonds in Argentina. Okay? Now my kids go to college, I need to get the money back in dollars to pay for the university. <coughs> what happened to my investment? Are my kids going to college or not? So, EJ, yeah, Kyok? Yeah. What happened to the portfolio of investors holding Argentinian stocks and bonds? Did the value go up or the value go down? So, I got more money? Hmm? So, here I bought the stocks, right? Let's say that the stock, this exchange rate, okay? Let's say the stock market stays the same, just for argument, even though the stock market goes down in the prices, right? So I buy 100 stocks, they cost 5 pesos each. How many dollars does it cost me? 500. I pay 500 dollars, right? I get uh, 500 pesos and I buy the, the stocks, right? Yes. Now the stocks are worth 500 pesos. We say the stock market went down, probably they're not worth 500 pesos, probably they're worth 300. But just to make it easier, they're still worth 500. And my kid needs to go to college. So I need to get dollars to pay for their tuition fee. How many dollars am I going to get back? 125. Is my kid going to college? No. <laughs> hmm? So you can see the risk. Do you understand? That's risk, right? Am I going to invest my kid's college money in a high-risk investment? No, probably not, right? What's the advantage if I get a big profit? They can drive a Lamborghini to college every day. <laughs> right? What's the disadvantage if I don't get a big profit? They don't go to college. Do I want risk? 
No, right? Most people, investors don't like risk, okay? Maybe you can get a higher return, but the point is it could be a worse situation if we lose money. <clears throat> so what about the other hand? We can have some opportunities for global firms. So what do you think happened to foreign multinationals importing from Argentina? For example, Walmart is importing a lot of Argentinian beef. Do you like Argentinian beef? Have you ever tried? Argentina is famous for beef. Do you know Walmart? Yes. Hmm? But basically, Korea bans almost every beef in the world, apart from Korean beef, right? And maybe Australian beef. Don't get to eat any other beef. So what's going to happen? Discuss with your partner. Is Walmart going to be happy or sad? Chinese. Uh, Moon Jae-won. Is Walmart happy or not happy? Why? Because the Argentina is more cheap. Beef is really cheap now, right? So before, it's the same thing. One beef was cost five pesos, it cost Walmart five dollars. Now how much does it cost Walmart to buy one beef? One dollar twenty-five. Is Walmart going to pass on all of the savings to their customers? Or keep some for themselves as profit? Keep some for themselves. Yes, right? They will maybe reduce the price of beef in their supermarket, but not the same amount. Maybe they'll take 50%. <laughs> Sounds like a nice number, right? Okay. So then the next, the last question, what do you think happened to foreign multinationals considering expanding FDI into Argentina after the peso weakened? For example, Ford Motor Factory wants to set up a factory in Argentina. What kind of cost do they have that's very cheap? What kind of cost? What do they need to buy? Construction. 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 Labor costs. Right? So that's one reason the British economy also could improve after 1992, right? The land was cheaper and right? labor was cheaper, so some, they attract a little bit more FDI. Okay. So uh, then do you have any other questions today?